before I jump in, I'm going to ask people, because I'm going to try to go pretty fast so that we get some time after Ben for some Q&A. How many people know about the electrification program at the federal level, have heard of like the NEVI program or the CFI grants and have a good sense of it? Okay, maybe 40%. Okay, so I'll cover a lot of it, not in great detail, but I'll cover it so that people have a sense of what's going on. And let me see if I can do two things at the same time. This is what I'm gonna try to cover today. Um, those of you that know me know I'm pretty freewheeling, but now that I work for the federal government, I'm gonna try to stick to the talking points. But you know, feel, feel free to ask questions afterwards. We are in an open application process right now for the CFI program. So there'll be sort of limitations on what, what I can answer. Um, but we'll introduce you to the joint office as well. Uh, this is the first time, by the way, that they've created an office across multiple agencies. I report to both of the deputy secretaries, who are wonderful people. Some of you might know Polly Trottenberg, who ran New York City DOT and now is the Deputy Secretary uh, at DOT, and then Dave Turk, who's the Deputy Secretary at DOE, amazing people, and both the secretaries are amazing people. That also drew me uh, to the job. We'll talk about the programs, and then we'll talk about how you braid funding a little bit, because I know that I think a lot of cities and towns are like, yeah, um, this is a lot, and it's really focused on just light duty vehicles, and so we're just gonna sorta sort of bide our time on this, but I really want to get the sense of urgency up to work faster um, and to take advantage of this funding now. So in terms of the federal approach and sort of why we're doing what we're doing, in 2016, if I remember correctly, it might uh, diverge a little bit with this graph, but it was the first time since 1980 that transportation was the largest emitter of greenhouse gas emissions. So um, there's a real priority in dealing with it. I mean, that's the good news, right? The data is not great, but the data forces you to move. I served on the um, transition for the Biden-Harris team for transportation, and I saw up close, like they were very serious about climate, very, very serious about climate, and very serious about equity. And, um, uh, and it's really built in, into the DNA of what the president's trying to do and what we're trying to do with this program as well. Um, and we need to bring this E, um, emission level down dramatically to get to a net uh, zero economy by 2050. And I think that's important to note. We're talking about literally reinventing the economy, right? So sometimes we all get caught up in like, hey, you know, I ride my bike or I take the bus or, you know, I don't buy from Amazon or whatever the like issue of the day is. Those are all very important things and very important issues. And the way we view ourselves but we gotta like go up a little bit and realize like we've been operating in a fossil fuel based economy for 130 years. This is a big shift and it's also a huge opportunity if we take advantage of it or we can bury our heads in the sand, not take advantage of it and let it happen to us. And uh, those of you that, that have seen me speak before, like I don't subscribe to that. I think you should be driving the bus, not be under the bus. So, this sort of reinforces what I was just saying, but in a little more granularity, you see that um, light duty vehicles are the biggest problem. Having said that, we've got, oh gosh, I'm gonna mess this up. It's, it's trillions of um, VMT miles uh, from uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles as well. I was actually just at a Daimler truck yesterday. Super impressive. You guys ever have a chance to go? It's in the city of Portland. They're, they're manufacturing electric Cascadia uh, class eight trucks and class six, seven trucks. I drove one yesterday. Uh, you can drive a class six without a CDL. Um, they also are building autonomous electric trucks, which is a use case for autonomy that makes a lot of sense. And we were talking about dedicated lanes on highways and, and, and that sort of stuff. But if you look at this picture, um, there's a lot of work to do, right? And so, we're gonna talk about shared mobility and electrifying it and all of that, but let's be honest that this country, the land use is what it is, right? And so it's not a either or, like, hey, we should just do this or just do that. We gotta do everything, right? And we gotta do it really quickly, and that means getting people out of fossil fuel powered vehicles and getting them into electric vehicles, even if they're single occupancy vehicles. If we can move them onto a bike in an urban area, great. I was over with Ben at um, Beeline, 
uh, day before yesterday, amazing operation. There's a huge opportunity to have electric cargo bikes delivering freight in cities. But it's gonna take a little time. So we have to do it all. Um, the good news is people are buying, using, renting. Hertz has, I'm with the Hertz CEO, they have 360,000 EVs on order. And those are shared vehicles, right? And they're renting them to gig drivers, they're, they're renting them to people. They're open to renting them maybe even on an, on an hourly basis down the road. So a lot of opportunity there, trial usage, but this is where I come in. The charging network needs some help. How many of you own an electric vehicle or use one regularly? Okay, let's get that number up. But no, no, but seriously, um, well, many of you probably don't own a vehicle because you're at Urbanism Next, right? It's not great. Um, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the charging stations out there are down at any given time. But that's also because charging stations sort of came to be like 15 years ago. I remember putting the first curbside charging station in DC in 2010 with Mayor Fenty. And that station's still there, but it's like sitting on its side, doesn't always work. Um, and so we have those first and second generation chargers that need to be upgraded. Um, we've also got newer chargers that just are going out because they have, they've been made into Christmas trees. They have card swipers on them. They have two modems. There's, there's other issues. Reliability is a huge issue. We're working on that. The good news is like we saw, I think, a 56% increase in charging stations between 2015 and 2020. We're seeing a dramatic increase in the last 12 to 18 months. And the money that we're gonna talk about hasn't even really hit the ground yet, right? RFPs are just starting to go out. Also, good news, um, micromobility. I mean, there's good and bad news here, right? Micromobility is exploding. Uh, I was just talking to uh, Bill Nesper. You know, people are buying many more e-bikes than cars. And of course they would, right? They're a lot cheaper. If you live in an urban area, same use case, but a lot easier to park, a lot cheaper, good for your health, all the outcomes that we want. Um, we were also talking about the bill that uh, Blumenauer has been working on for a long time in Portland and others to give rebates and credits at the point of purchase for e-bikes, which is great. The other side of the coin is the business models are a little squirrely. And I would actually go further. I, I wrote an article for those of you that are transportation geeks, nerds, or into the economy, um, that uh, transportation services don't make any money. They don't. You could be an airline, you could be Uber uh, or Lyft, you could be Capital Bike Share, although it actually almost breaks even in the city. You could be just about anything. They don't make money. They don't. So, um, you know, more and more you see cities, towns starting to think about the outcomes that they want. And like, if you want car to go in your city, don't charge four to $500 a month for the space. If you want scooters in your city, don't charge an outlandish permit fee per year and expect that they're gonna be there. Transportation is a utility. It gives people mobility and it gives lower income people upward mobility. So we've got to start thinking about that at the city level and at the federal level, to be honest with you. What do we want and how do we want to fund it? What are the outcomes? What are the social outcomes that we want? And that brings me to this. This is probably often overlooked or not known by a lot of people. It just came out maybe 60 days ago. It was announced by both my bosses, Secretary, my other bosses, Secretary Granholm and Secretary Buttigieg. This is an amazing document. I think one of the most important documents to come out of the federal government in the last decade, the National Blueprint for Transportation Decarbonization, goes beyond DOT and DOE, also goes to EPA and to HUD. And the idea is to get ahead of some of these issues and work with the agencies to think about how we truly decarbonize, break down the silos. For instance, with HUD, we're talking about all their multi-unit buildings across the country, and of course, all the folks that own them, how do we work with them to electrify in a multimodal way, in a cost-effective way, not just to put charging stations in, to, but to provide real outcomes for people. And that's another message I wanna to try to get out to folks like you today, is that we are focused on outcomes, not just on putting in chargers, but that means actually that the people in the states and regions and cities also need to do that, because in many ways, the federal government, I mean, we set policy, right? 
And our office, by the way, has worked very hard to set policy. We'll talk about that in just a minute with the White House and, and DOT and DOE. But there's an ATM component too. We put the money out there and we give guidance, but then folks have to decide how they want to spend it within certain parameters. That's where we come in. So um, for those of you that don't know, um, we were funded by the bipartisan infrastructure law to the tune of $300 million. And we're planning about a five to six year run initially. Um, and we have nine major areas of emphasis, which I don't have time to go into today. But if you Google Joint Office of Energy and Transportation, MOU, you can look it up and see. And it includes things like transmission pilots in the right of way. It also includes anything that Secretary Grant and Homer Buttigieg decide they want us to do. So there's the opportunity to expand. And there's actually a bill in Congress right now, we'll see where it goes, that would expand us to other, other areas. This is our mission and vision. I think the vision is important, a future where everyone can ride and drive electric. Notice it's not just drive, it's ride. Um, we understand that in urbanized areas, the use cases are different, the goals within the city are different, the outcomes that you're going for are different. Um, they're often around health and equity, right? Um, they're often around mobility, right? Not necessarily ownership. And the mission is to, an acceler to accelerate an electrified transportation system that is affordable, convenient, equitable, reliable, and safe. The other thing is it should be frictionless to use, right? Like it should be like using your iPhone. So we set minimum standards of 97% uptime versus what now might be around 70% uptime for chargers. But even 97% needs to be better than that. I mean, imagine if your phone worked 97% of the time. That wouldn't be acceptable. These are the programs that we support, and that's why I asked that question at the beginning. The National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Formula Program is $5 billion over five years. There's actually a 10% holdback, so it's actually like 4.6 billion approximately, 4.56 billion. And that money is formula funding that goes to the states. Once they reach fully built out status on the alternative fuel corridors, then that money can be used for other things like instead of four ports, 150 kilowatts, could be used for level two chargers in cities, right? My, uh, mobility hubs in cities. And then we've got the CFI grants that I'll cover in more detail in just a minute. But we also support transit. So we're working very closely with FTA um, on, in their $5.6 billion LONO uh, program and the clean school bus program, which is one of the best use cases for electrification. It's the same route every single day. It's super predictable, really efficient. And when you talk about creating a, dis a distributed energy system, those batteries become little power plants, right? And they're big. That's why I was excited also to take this job. I and mean, we're talking about reinventing energy and how it works and how it flows and going from a centralized energy system to a decentralized energy system where people produce at their homes, they store, and they sell back to the grid out of their vehicles or out of their homes. NEVI program I just talked about, there's 1.5 billion on the streets right now. Um, so ODOT has a big chunk of money and they're working and asking local jurisdictions like Portland, would you like to participate? Or would you like to work with us on the CFI grant? So that money is real and it's on the streets. What we're asking for with the NEVI program is a minimum, this is a minimum of four ports every 50 miles, 150 kilowatt minimum. So if a state wants to put in 20 ports, 350 kilowatts, by all means, this is just a minimum standard. Um, it has to be a CCS plug. CCS is what they use in Europe, and that's predominantly what's used in the US. We did do a big, well, we worked with Tesla for a while and got them to um, start to open up their network they have their own standard. So you can see, the, per the drawing, you can have another port as long as the primary port is CCS. So if you wanna have Tesla or something else, you certainly can. In terms of the, the CFI program, this is like the big reason I'm here today is to talk to you guys about this. There's $700 million in funding now, that's two years of the five-year program. There's corridor and community. Corridor, in some sense mirrors NEVI, but it's discretionary money. 
right? There's more flexibility. Community is definitely focused on cities. One thing I want to mention too is that by our analysis through the national labs, we work very closely with, I don't know if there's 16 or 17 labs, I can never remember, but we work with probably eight of them. 90% of the charging out there is probably going to be level two based on our uh, analysis. I put a level two charger in my house for $300 for the charger and about $600 to put it in. DC fast charger can range between 50 and $125,000. Big difference, right? So when you think about how much you can do with 1.25 billion, if the majority is level two chargers, it's a lot. It's a lot of chargers. And some people say, yeah, 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 but you need to be able to fill it really fast, just like gas. It needs to be just like the gas station. Remember the use case is different. Um, whether you live in multifamily or you have a, a your, your own house, you know, or you, you drive to work, whatever the case may be, or you have a fleet. Cars still sit 94.8% of the time. So when should you charge it? When you're driving it? This is easy, guys. <laughs> People need more coffee. Okay, no. <laughs> you, should, you should let it passively charge while it's parked. And that goes for your bike, too. Like, you're not, well, maybe with regenerative braking you are, but for the most part, you just park your bike at night and you charge it up. It's the same thing. So here's the quarter program. The big thing to note here, there's no maximum, uh, and the minimum is $1 million. You must contract with a private entity. <clears throat> you have to. That's part of the grant. And there's a 20% match, and they can provide it. Community program. This is the one you guys are going to, probably care about more. Minimum award, 500,000. That's pretty small. It could be a, I mean, both of these, the government has to apply. You can partner with a consortium, nonprofits, companies. Um, so you can do like a real community project. The maximum award is 15 million, which is quite a bit, particularly if you're talking level two charging. Both of these, they have to be publicly accessible. So they can't be like behind a fence and nobody else can use it but one company or one person. These are the eligible entities. As you can see, it's really government or government authorities in partnership uh, with others. I actually last night made this slide because again, I think towns and cities are like, ah, eh, this is just for like, I, Nico knows, I don't usually do slides with lots of words. But you can go to the grant yourself and you can Search, search for multimodal, search for shared, search for bike, search for whatever you want. There's a lot there. I'm not going to, you can read this yourself, but you can see that it's for multimodal hubs. It's for shared mobility. I personally wrote um, many of, of you know, these things in here. Um, so, you know, be creative and don't feel limited. Like, hey, eh, this is just, you know, supplanting private sector investment for people that you know, drive their cars. It can be what you want it to be. Um, and that's our goal, is to put, put the money out there with parameters, with guidelines, with minimum standards, by America standards, and then apply for what you want and how you want to do it. One more thing, um, and Ben will talk about his smart grants, which are awesome. Um, you know, because this is five-year money, it's going to re-up every year. So if you want to do a smaller scale implementation than something larger in a couple of years, we're going to have funding for that. And there's lots of different types of funding. If you have questions about the CFI grants, um, you want to email DOT direct versus us just because it is an open application process. You can email us through our website too. Probably we'll take it to them. Also, you can find um, at our website, driveelectric.gov, um, other funding opportunities. We have our own funding opportunity through the joint office from our $300 million bucket. And we have some interesting topics, including community-driven models for electric vehicle charging deployment, which again is focused on outcomes, equitable outcomes in urbanized areas and experimentation. So check that out as well. We have, there's an, a rural EV toolkit out that's really good. The new version's coming soon. We're announcing the next couple weeks the urban toolkit. Um, so probably around May 8th or 10th, we'll put that out. It's going to be great. It's going to have lots of information. 
I personally got in there and edited it quite a bit. It'll give you, I think this is important, this is just a snapshot. This is actually an 86-line spreadsheet. But it'll give you these braiding uh, opportunities. So you can figure out, like, hey, I want to do micromobility as well as DC fast charging at the curb. Like, they have Electric Avenue right here. So if you want to add micromobility, it'll give you the funding streams that you can pair with it. And we'll also have benchmarks, case studies, use cases. Also, check out the EV Charging Justice 40 map. You can go to our website and link to that. It's uh, based on 22 metrics. It's national. It's really, really good. So whether it's um, health disadvantages, mobility disadvantages, all of it is calculated in there. And that's our website. Soon we'll have rideelectric.gov. I've been pushing for that. It'll be up soon. It, it'll point basically to the same place. And if you do uh, contact us, there's 20 people behind the scenes that are there just to answer questions. So um, you'll get an answer within 48 hours, even if it's, hey, we don't know the answer, but we'll go get the answer. And that's a lot of our job, is to pull together all the resources in this opaque big federal government and to get people the answers they need to be successful. Thank you so much.